So as, as I said before, prayer, forgiveness is a major theme in the Bible. We should be concerned uh, not only with our own forgiveness, because all of us are in need of the forgiveness of God, but we also must be concerned with forgiving others as well. After all, Jesus came and died to offer me and you forgiveness so that we don't have to suffer the just penalty that we owe for our sins. And so we're going to look at what Jesus is teaching here in these three parables. And the first, one of the first things that I notice is that there is a progression. The lost sheep is one out of a hundred. The lost coin is one out of ten. And the lost son is one out of two. And really, as we're going to see, really both sons are lost. And so I think there's an important reason for that. But um, what I believe is happening here one of the things that Jesus is trying to teach us by this progression is that there is a, a difference, or there should be a difference with the way we approach the sinner. Now, all sin is, is sin, and any sin will cause you to be lost if you don't deal with it as you should. But there is a difference between a young person who sins and an older person or a church leader who sins. And I think that's part of what Jesus is trying to get across. This lost sheep is one out of a hundred. I believe that basically represents a new convert or a babe in Christ. Now, it's important for us to get across right at the outset that Jesus is not preaching to what we would call alien sinners. These are Jews. They're covenant members of the household of God. And yet they're sinners. And so the Pharisees and some of the other religious leaders, they look down on Jesus. They think, how can this man be a prophet or be somebody important? How can he be a good man? And yet he spends his time with sinners. And so Jesus is trying to get across in this chapter that that's his purpose. That's why he came. He came in order to save sinners. And he can't do that without talking to them and preaching to them. And so uh, there are those represented by this lost sheep who I believe represents a new convert. We'll get to that more in, in just a few minutes. And then the coin, a 10% loss, 1 out of 10, is, is maybe somebody that's that's uh, been in the church, we would say, for a number of, I don't know how long exactly, but they're, they've been in there for a while, and it's, it's, it's a little bit of a bigger loss. And then the lost son is one out of two. And we're going to notice that there's differences. That way, each one of these are handled. There's a difference in the way that it's handled. Now, they must all be dealt with. They must all be, if they're going to be forgiven, they have to be brought back into the fold. But there's a difference in how they are handled. So we're going to start with the lost sheep. And the first thing that happens in this story, after the sheep is lost, the shepherd leaves the other 99, those who are safe, to go and find the one that's lost. And, I, and again, I believe that, that, that Jesus is trying to teach us that especially as church leaders, but even as, as, as Christians, as members of the church, we have a responsibility to bear one another's burdens. And to take care of one another uh, as best we can. And part of that means when one is lost, we do what we can to go and bring them back. And so that's what happens in this story. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, uh, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them. To observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now I know primarily, and this, this is what we call the Great Commission, Jesus gives us all, as Christians, the responsibility to evangelize, to go out and to bring the, the, the gospel, the message of salvation to men. And in Luke 15, he's not necessarily talking about alien sinners the way this passage is referring to. But it's still the same sort of message. We still have a responsibility, maybe even a greater responsibility, with those that are in the church, with those that are in the house of God, the family of God. We 
we talked about last time. We have a responsibility to see to their needs. And part of that includes when, when they have some problem, especially sin, we have a duty to help and assist them and bring them back to Jesus. Now, this is an important point. The sheep knows it's lost. It's lost because of its own fault. I don't know if it wandered off. Maybe it was eating some particular uh, good from a particular good pasture or something, and the shepherd led the sheep uh, away, and, and the sheep didn't know. I don't know how it got lost. But it's, it's its own fault that it's lost. It knows it's lost, but it doesn't know how to get back. And so it's the shepherd's job to go and to find the sheep and bring it back, because it cannot get back on its own. And that, I believe, is why it represents a new convert. You know, you're not expected with the, the first day you're baptized, or even in the first 30 days you're baptized, to be able to follow the teachings of the gospel completely. Now, that should be your goal. And it's our goal as the church to assist you if you're a new convert. But there's going to be some slip-ups. It's just like with a small child. When a child first begins to walk, they're going to fall. They're going to get hurt. That's the same thing with the new convert in Christ. There's going to be some issues. And we as a church then have to learn how to assist one another and bring them back because they can't get back on their own. They're not mature enough. They don't know how to get back on their own. And so it's our job, especially leaders in the church, but even other Christians as well, um, to bring them back into the family of God. And then you have the lost coin. It's interesting, the coin, first of all, is lost in the house. I believe the house there represents the church. The coin is lost in the house. And the coin don't even know it's lost. Now, I failed to mention this earlier. I believe Jesus is using that lost sheep. For us, it represents a new convert. For these Jews, it represented those tax collectors and sinners that the Pharisees were angry that Jesus wouldn't spend time with. Jesus is illustrating, just like a shepherd goes out to bring the lost sheep back to the fold, that's what he's doing. That's why he's eating with the tax collectors and the sinners. Because he's trying to bring them back into the house of God, into the, into the sheepfold. And the, the Pharisees are the very religious leaders that should have been doing that. It shouldn't have been necessary for Jesus to have to go out and do that. But it was because they weren't doing their job. Rather than going out and trying to bring those sinners back, they were just looking down on them. They were just kind of turning their nose up at them. And they wouldn't have anything to do with them. And so Jesus says, that's wrong. That's the wrong attitude. You should be going and bringing these back. But now, this lost coin, I believe, represents the Pharisees and the, and the scribes and the religious leaders of that day. Because... They think they're safe. They think that because uh, they can trace their lineage back to Abraham and that uh, they have this covenant based upon the covenant they with Abraham and all the way down through the line, that they're safe. But Jesus is trying to teach them they too need forgiveness. They don't realize it. They think they're safe, but they too need forgiveness. And so that's represented by this lost coin. This coin, again, represents a little bit of a bigger loss. This is one out of ten. And uh, the coin is lost through no fault of its own. And it's lost in the house. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, <laughs> ye that work iniquity. Part of what I believe Jesus is teaching in this passage is that there are going to be those in the day of judgment who are going to be surprised that they're lost. They think they're safe. Now, this is scary to me because it might apply to me. I need to take a careful inventory of my life to make sure that I'm not just one who thinks I'm safe when I'm really lost. But it's also scary to me because there may be those sitting here in this building 
and you think you're safe, and you're not. And I don't know you. I don't know your life. I, you know, you're the only one that can judge that. You and the Lord. But it's possible to think you're safe and to be lost. And that's the case with this coin. The coin has no knowledge that it's lost until the woman begins to sweep the house and uh, and to, and to clean it and to search for this coin. Now it's really the woman's fault. It's not the coin's fault. The coin, as we say, the coin can't grow legs and walk away. The coin can't lose itself. The woman won't lost the coin. And I believe this moment represents leadership. We have a responsibility to, as I've already said, uh, watch out for each other. But especially if you're a leader in the church, you have a great responsibility to care for and to watch out for those in the church. James says in James chapter 3 and verse 1, My brethren, let not many uh, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Now, that word master there could be translated church leader. In fact, I think the New King James and other translations translate that word teacher. Um, and so James is talking about leadership, really is what he's talking about. And in the rest of that chapter, he talks about sins of the tongue. And I believe primarily, now everybody has a responsibility to bridle their, bridle their tongue and to control their tongue. But I believe primarily uh, in that chapter, he's talking about leadership. He's talking about people especially that stand up in the pulpit and, and, and speak uh, from God's word. We have to be careful. And he says, because we shall receive a greater condemnation. I believe this is also what Jesus is trying to teach in this parable about the lost coin. Because it's the woman's fault that the coin's lost. And she, it's necessary for her to clean the house and to search for that coin. In the same way, it's the responsibility of the leadership to know the members that are in their congregation and to spend time with them and so that they are in a position to where they know if somebody's in the house and lost. And they can assist them and bring them back. In Romans chapter 14, verses 10 through 12, Paul says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou say it not, my brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now, the point is, I am going to answer for myself, for my own actions, and for my own sins. But also, especially when it comes to my, you know, the man, we kind of talked about this last time, the man is supposed to lead his family. That's, that's the God-given role. And so not only am I going to answer for myself, I'm also in a certain way going to answer for my family as to whether or not I've led them toward God and not the other direction. And in the same way with the church, if, if I'm putting myself in a leadership role, I know we don't always think of it that way, but really, um, you don't have to be an elder to be a leader. You know, those who, especially that occupy this pulpit, and, and preach and, and speak to the congregation. We're in, whether we like it or not, whether we want to think about that, we're in a leadership role. And so I'm going to be judged not only for myself and what I've done, but in what I've led you to do. And that's what uh, James is trying to get across. And, and Paul says, yes, I'm going to answer for myself, but I also may have to answer for others. And so sometimes it's necessary, like this woman does, to sweep the house. Sometimes we need to do a little bit of spring cleaning, even in the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, Paul says, Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so now I know Paul is dealing with a very specific sin in 1 Corinthians 5. But still, leaven is used in the Bible as a type of sin. That's why in the Old Testament uh, the, the Passover mark, the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was lasted seven days. And during that week they were not allowed to have any leaven in the house. They had to purge out all the leaven out of their house. And that was to signify or to symbolize putting the sin out of their life. 
And that's the same sort of symbol that Paul is referencing here. We have to keep the sin out of the church. The same way they were to put the leaven out of the house during this feast. Part of the reason why uh, the loaf, when we observe the Lord's Supper, is unleavened is because it was during this feast. They couldn't have leavened bread. And leaven uh, uh, symbolizes sin. And the body of Jesus, the, the, the not just the body of Jesus, but the, the, the life of Jesus, Jesus, while he was here, was without sin. And so we use a loaf of unleavened bread to symbolize his body because it symbolizes that he's without sin. In the same way, the church, which is his body, which is his family, must be without sin. Now, I know that nobody's perfect, and therefore the church is not perfect because I'm part of it, and I'm not perfect. But it is a goal. It is something that we must strive for and work toward, and it's something that we should assist one another in. And so sometimes, in order to bring those that are lost back into the fold, sometimes they don't even know they're lost. And so we need maybe to do a little bit of spring cleaning. And again, I believe that involves getting to know our brethren, spending time with them, uh, learning what they believe and what they practice, not just when they come to church on Sunday, but in their daily life. <laughs> Because we can't assist one another in living the Christian life and being forgiven from our sins if we're not spending time, if we're not actually a family with one another. So that's part of what's required as Christians and as the church. But then we get to the parable of the lost son. And even though this is the greatest loss, this is one out of two, this man only has two sons, one of them. Uh, and we're skipping over some of the story just for the sake of time, but he, he, he demands his inheritance, he gets it, and he leaves. And when the sheep gets lost, the shepherd goes out and finds it. When the coin is lost, the woman cleans and sweeps the house until she finds it. When the son leaves, the father just lets him go. And I think, again, Jesus is trying to teach us, to show us, there's different ways in which we handle sinners. The sheep knows it's lost, but it can't get back on its own. The coin is lost in the house because of the woman's mistake. It doesn't even know it's lost. The son knows he's lost, knows exactly how he's lost, and he knows how to get back. And so there's no search made for the son. Because the only one that can find the son, as we read, is himself. The Bible says he came to himself. The father didn't go out and find him, but the shepherd finds the coin. The son had to come to himself. And so, when you're a mature Christian, there's a difference when you sin. You know, uh, that's why Paul says, when he's talking about elders, not to receive an accusation from an elder from just unless there's two or three witnesses. Because it's a big deal when an older person, when a church leader sins. You know, my son, now he's 11 now. And so he doesn't make mistakes like he used to, but he still makes mistakes, and you expect that. He's 11. It's not, now, you still have to correct it when he, make, when he messes up, and we have to try to teach him and show him how to do right, but it's a different deal when I mess up. And that's the way it is in the church as well. We expect, now I'm not saying it's okay and that we shouldn't deal with it, but we expect younger, newer Christians to mess up. But it's a much bigger deal. And sometimes the older ones do mess up. And we have to deal with that too. But it's a different, uh, it's, 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 it's different the way we deal with it, the way we handle that. And so one of the differences is um, the father just lets the son go. You know, I, I referenced this last time, Psalm 127. I'm not going to read it, uh, the whole thing. But one of the things that stands out to me from this psalm about this, this, uh, Father, this warrior, Solomon says, who has his uh, his uh, quiver full of arrows which represent children, is again for arrows to do their job. You've got to at some point draw back and let it go. And I think that's exactly what uh, has happened here in this parable about the lost son. When the son leaves, the father just lets him go. But then, you know, after everything happens, he runs out of money, he begins to uh, be in one, he, he finds himself. Uh, you know, my, when my dad tells the story, he talks about slopping hogs. You know, <laughs> I, I I don't know a whole lot about pigs, but I know they're not the cleanest animals, obviously. But to a Jew now, it 
was, it, it, not only did they consider pigs unclean animals, but you could become unclean. You could become outside of the family of God if you had anything to do with one. They had a different dietary law than what we live under. And so for this Jewish boy to be feeding pigs, and not only to be feeding them, but to want to eat what they eat, he's really got, he's, he's down to as low as he can get. He's hit rock bottom, as we sometimes say. But again, there's no search made. We read in verse 17 of Luke 15, and when he came to himself, now this is an important point. There were, the sheep, the shepherd went and found the sheep because he didn't know how to get back. The woman had to sweep and clean the house to find that coin because it didn't know how to get back. They didn't even know it was lost. But the son was able to come to himself. And sometimes that's what it, that, that's all that's what we have. I mean, all we can do is let them go and wait. If there's somebody that we know knows what's right, and they simply choose to do what's wrong anyway. That's the case with this son. He, though, finally came to himself in verse 17. He said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Now I want you to stop and think for a minute about this boy's humility. He's still his father's son. But he recognizes that he has forfeited his right as a son. When he took his inheritance and went out and wasted it. All he's hoping for is that his father will make him a hired servant. Like one of the other servants that his, that his father uh, won't owns or has working for him. Now think about our situation, my situation. You know, Paul says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, I believe that one of these two sons represents everybody in this room. Hopefully it's this first one. Because you don't want to be like the second one. We'll get to that in a minute. But one of these two sons represents everybody in this room. All of us have seen it. All of us are in need or have been in need of forgiveness. For the blood of Jesus. And all we could hope for is that God would take us and make us a higher servant. But as we're going to see with this father, he doesn't just take his son back and make him a servant. He takes him back fully as his son. With all the rights and privileges. And that's exactly what God does for us. He doesn't just take us back as his servants, but he takes us back, as we talked about again last time, he takes us back and makes us his sons, his daughters, his family. And he does that through the blood of Jesus. Now notice, even though this father, and this, is, this, this teaches us something about who God is, it also is a lesson that we should learn about what leadership is. Because even though this father doesn't actively go out and search for his son, I don't mean he gave up on. And it don't mean he's not looking for him. Because this father sees his son while he's still way off yonder somewhere. I don't know how far away he is. I don't know if this is, you know, mountainous, hilly country like around here. And maybe you can't see or if it's flat like it is out in West Texas where you can see forever. I don't know how far away he is. But the Bible says he's still a great way off and he sees him coming because he's been looking for him. He's been waiting for his son to come back. And then, of course... There's a great celebration. And that's common in every one of these parables. When the sinner returns, there's a great celebration. And we need to make sure we celebrate. When we witness a baptism, when we are able to assist a brother or sister, when they want to come back, it's a celebration. It's not a time to say, well, you did this or you did that or how are you going to... Now, I do believe people need to repent. And, and I'm not saying that, that, that we don't do that. But when somebody repents and comes back, it's a celebration. And we need to make sure that we celebrate that. Because as Jesus says over and over again in this chapter, there's celebration in heaven when a sinner returns, when a sinner repents. We should celebrate along with heaven. But of course, there's also the elder son. And I talked a little bit about this when I talked about Jonah. Because... 
just like Jonah, instead of rejoicing when those people of Nineveh repented, this elder son, he doesn't rejoice with his father and with the rest of his family when his younger brother returns. It says in verses 28 through 30 of Luke 15, speaking of the elder son, he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgress I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou ne never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. This is the message that I believe Jesus is trying to get across to these religious leaders. They're looking down on Jesus because he's spending time with sinners that don't know how to get back, represented by the sheep and by the coin. Some of them, I believe both of these sons probably represent uh, Jews. Some of them, even the religious leaders, not most, but some of them will come to themselves like this lost son did and, and obey the gospel and become members of the church. But most of them are like this older son. And they refuse to accept that God is accepting these sinners, especially later, not doesn't really happen here, but later on when we get into the book of Acts, there becomes an issue with when Gentiles are accepted into the church. But that's a really another story. But Jesus is trying to point out to these religious leaders, you're lost. You don't think you are. You don't think you need forgiveness. You don't think you need God's grace, but you're lost. You look down on these sinners the way this older brother looks down on his younger brother, but he's lost. When he says, he says that um, uh, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress thy any time thy commandment, he's lying. I don't know that he knows he's lying. He's probably lying to himself, but he is lying. That's what John says in 1 John. He says, if we say we have no sin, we are liars and know not the truth. And that's exactly the problem this, that this older brother has. He is lying to himself and to his father when he says that he has not sinned and does not need forgiveness. And that's exactly the problem that these religious leaders that Jesus is dealing with, that that's the problem they're having. They believe they're better than the tax collectors and these sinners that they call sinners and look down on it. They don't believe that they need forgiveness. The father responds in verses 31 and 32, and he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was me that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. Now, I've already talked about this a little bit, but if, if you're not moved when you witness the baptism, if you're not moved and overcome with joy when you see a brother or sister come back to God, you've got a problem. You're, you have the same problem that this older brother had. Maybe it's you that needs forgiveness. Maybe it's you that needs to come to yourself. If you do not or you're, are not able to rejoice with heaven, when a sinner repents. Now I'm going to close with this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So I think this is important for all of us to get. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, Paul says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's a pretty extensive list of sin. It's not comprehensive. They're, you know, it's not intended to list every kind of sin you can commit. But Paul is saying you cannot have sin in your life and enter into the kingdom of God. You cannot have sin in your life and, and, and at the same time uh, be a faithful member of the church. It just won't work. You cannot have sin in your life and go to heaven. It can't happen. The only way we can, have, we, can, we can go to heaven is to have our sin taken away, to have our sin forgiven. And he's going to explain how we do that in the next minute. And so it's important that I recognize the sin in my own life 
and that I help my brethren also, but I better have the right attitude. I better not look down on them and not be able to rejoice with them when they come back. In verse 11, he says, and such were some of you. Now, I believe we can say the same thing to the church here. Now, you look at this list and you may think, well, a lot of this stuff is way worse than anything I've done. But let me say, sin is sin. Now, I do believe there are categories of sin and, 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 and you know, even Jesus talked about greater and lesser sin. But any sin will keep you out of heaven if you don't deal with it. And so this applies to us just as much as it did to Corinth. And such were some of you. All of us, like I said, uh, have sinned. But ye are washed. Now what's Paul talking about when he says you're washed? He's talking about baptism. How, how are we saved from our sins? How can we come out from our sin and be forgiven and enjoy all of these, uh, have this rejoicing in heaven? Well, it's, you're washed, but you are sanctified. That word sanctified just means set apart. In uh, John 17 and verse 17, Jesus in his prayer says, Sanctify them uh, by the truth. Your word is truth. It's God's word that sanctifies us or sets us apart or separates us from the world, from our sin. It's through uh, the word of God. That's why Paul says in uh, Romans chapter 10 that not, they've not all obeyed the gospel. When we obey the gospel, we are saved from our sins, when we're washed in baptism. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, by the Spirit of our God. And so, yes, we all need forgiveness. Yes, I need forgiveness. And that's not just in the past tense, unfortunately. Um, you know, I, I obviously I, I can't stand up here and try to tell you that you can always be like me. Unfortunately, I'm I, I need forgiveness as well. All of us do. And so it's important that as Christians, we look for not only our own lives, not only do I have a responsibility to measure my own life and to weigh it within the teachings of God's Word, but I have a responsibility to you. And you have a responsibility to me to help each other and to bear one another's burdens and help each other get to heaven. Lesson is yours. Hopefully what I've had to say has been edifying. Of course, we never close without extending the invitation. If you're here this morning and you have never obeyed the gospel, you need to do that. Jesus says in John chapter 8 and verse 24, except you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Surely everybody that's here believes in Jesus. It's only through Jesus, as we've talked about this morning, we can be forgiven of our sins. Jesus says in... Uh, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32, although I'm getting ahead of myself, we usually put repentance first. I don't know if the order matters all that much. But in Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, Jesus says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now that word repentance, and we've talked about it a little bit uh, this morning as well, that when that says that, that that younger son came to himself, another way to put that is he repented. Really what repentance is, is it's just deciding I'm no longer going to live for myself or for sin, but I'm going to live for Jesus. It's a decision that I make. And we must repent from our sins if we're going to receive the salvation that Jesus offers. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, that if we confess him before men, he will confess us before the Father. And, you know, I, I, I do believe... That a confession like, like uh, the eunuch makes in Acts chapter 8 and verse 37. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I do believe that that is necessary before you're baptized into Christ. But I believe that confession should be more than just something you say before you're baptized. I believe that it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, some, I assume they still do that here. We did in Texas too. You know, every morning in school we said the Pledge of Allegiance. Right? It's kind of the same thing. Well, not the same thing, but it's similar when we make that confession that I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I'm pledging my allegiance that I'm, that, that I'm going to serve Him. That I'm going to follow Him for the rest of my life. And, and I, again, I think that's something we must do before we're baptized, but it ought to be something that follows us, that we carry with us for the rest of our lives as well. And then, of course, as we've talked about, we need to be baptized. In Mark chapter 16, and verse 16, Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized 
shall be saved. And so if you're here this morning and you've never done that, now's the time. And like we've also been saying, just because you follow those steps, you become a Christian, it doesn't magically make you perfect. I still make mistakes. We all do. John says in uh, 1 John chapter 1 that uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, that we have fellowship with the Father. He goes on to talk about the sin. He says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. James says in James chapter 5 and verse 16 that we should confess our sins one to another and pray one for another for the effectual for the prayer of a righteous man avails much. So if you're here this morning and you need to obey the gospel and the prayers of the church, please come while we stand and while we sing.